Good evening, everybody. Um, glad to see everybody here. Welcome to tonight's program, which is the um, final of the three-part series of George Bakula's transcribing early handwritten documents. And um, at, at the end of the program, we will also talk about um, what sorts of projects we have available. We've kind of you know, alluded to those along the way and how you can actually sign up. Of course, you know, that's not a requirement of participating in this, but um, if you have some interest, you want to even just, you know, try it out for a document and see how it goes, um, we would love to have you um, try that out. So that's coming at the end. And we'll also let you know about next week's program, if you can take another Thursday Zoom meeting. Um, and uh, just to remind you, this program is getting recorded. We'd love to see your faces, but if you're opposed to that, um, feel free to turn off your uh, camera, and we are asking people to turn off their um, mics unless you are speaking, unless you're one of the presenters. Um, we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end. If you have questions, we want you to put them in the chat, um, and Meg will be watching that. Um, that's Meg Baker. Well, she's up in the corner on my screen. I'm not sure where she is on yours. Wave again, Meg. So Meg Baker, she's assistant curator at the Hatfield Historical Museum. Um, and uh, and just if you you know haven't been on Zoom a lot, um, the chat you know you can usually get to it by moving your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, or if you're on an iPad up at the top, um, and clicking on that just so it's open. So if you have a an idea for a question, you can you can drop it in there. Um, it won't give George's whole bio again because I've been giving it every week, and people may be tired of hearing it. But um, anyway, he's on the Hatfield Historical Society board. He's a native of Hatfield. He's been doing. Um, tons of great work for the Historical Society for the last number of years, including transcribing lots of cool things. So um, without further ado, um, I think we're gonna get started. So George, on to you. <clears throat> okay, I'll take over the screen here. Okay, we'll do a... Uh... Okay, this, this is the uh, third class in the series of uh, transcribing digitizing Hatfield's early handwritten documents. And just as a quick recap, in the, in the first class, we, we went through reading and transcribing and examples. Uh, the second class was formatting those transcriptions that everyone had done. And in this class, um, we're gonna actually look at how the transcriptions can be used to uh, explore some of Hatfield's history. So we'll have uh, one example of using a document from the Ryan collection, we'll talk about that. And then we'll go through some of the vital records in Hatfield and, and um, show you the kind of things that when you format um, a spreadsheet with um, data, as we suggested in the second class, that you can come up with, ask a lot of interesting questions and come up with some nice, uh, uh, examples of how to present uh, that data. So that'll be the first half of the class. The second will be um, Meg talking about available projects and, and signing up for um, volunteering possibilities. So one of the documents in the Ryan collection that we had is um, this document on the left, and I did a transcription on the right. This is, this is a Whiteley Schoolhouse contract um, dated 1813. And in this, in this contract, they give a lot of the uh, um, specifications and it, it was very interesting to me anyway. So one of the things I did was uh, we ended up writing a, a, a short blog article that went into the uh, Historical Society website. And that, that blog article uh, one of the first things we did was, in reading through that contract, we did a little bit of research to try to figure out where in Whateley, this is West Whateley, um, the Southwest Schoolhouse that they contracted for was actually built. And it turned out, we found out that uh, <clears throat> it was probably somewhere on Haydenville Road, if you're familiar with West Whateley, Haydenville Road between Conway Road and Weber Road. So based, based on that little bit of information that we had about where it might be, uh, Monica, my wife, put together this picture based on 
that location and the specifications in the contract uh, made a picture, this picture of what it might have looked like. So today, Weber Road probably runs along this path somewhere here. And based on the location, there would have been this, this view would have been looking probably northeast. Uh, there's a hill right behind it, and there's a little valley below it. Uh, there's hills farther off to the east. The specifications in the contract stated that the schoolhouse should have two chimneys, a hip roof, should have um, 24 pane uh, glass or 24, divide, 24 divided lights or panes of glass, and there should be shutters on the windows. And finally, it should be made of good brick. Well, we, we posted this blog and shortly after we got some feedback saying that um, indeed the Southwest Schoolhouse was on Haydenville Road in that area and actually it still exists. The only problem is it's not brick. So there was a little bit of a, a discrepancy there and somewhat of a mystery. So wait, waiting a little bit longer, it was maybe a month or, or so after that, uh, we got a little more feedback. A reader had found a, um, an article that was written in the Norfolk Mass Advertiser and dated August 30th, 1834, that described a whirlwind that had gone through Williamsburg and West Whateley, leaving a, a, about a half mile path of destruction that damaged several buildings. One of the buildings that they mentioned was a schoolhouse in West Whaley. Apparently the roof had been blown off and the brick walls had been knocked down. So here, here's an example of taking a simple document, transcribing it, writing a blog and being able to actually fill in some of the details of what happened uh, to that building about 200 years ago. So moving on to the vital records, this is just another picture of what the Hatfield Town Hall may have looked like um, in the 1800s that Monica drew. And what I'll do is go through having taken the, the, the town records, the vital records of the town, the marriages, births, and deaths, and put them into spreadsheets, uh, as I described in the last meeting. Um, we're able to do a number of things. The first, the first thing I'll show is that uh, several people come to Hatfield and the, the, to the Historical Society and ask about uh, their ancestors and any, for any information, they're looking for any information that uh, the Historical Society might have on their families. And one of the things that we can do here with, this, with the way we formatted the data is very quickly create lists of marriages, births, and deaths for that family. And I'll show some examples of that. And finally, I'll show some simple questions that could be answered about births, deaths, and, and marriages in Hatfield um, in what follows. And I'll do that next. Oops. So I have to uh, do a new share here. Okay, so <clears throat> in this example, this is um, just some software that I use uh, to be able to go through and uh, just, I'm not gonna show you how it's done, but just to very quickly read in, read in the documents, the spreadsheets, uh, define some search functions, and then we can actually explore using those search functions. So as I said, one of the things we can do very quickly and easily is Take, for example, in this case, look at the town, Hatfield Town records and look for all the records relating to the Snow family in Hatfield. And if I run that, then we get this list. And I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but just point out some of the, some of the things that you can find out pretty easily about a family when, uh, when you have this capability. So there's a marriage, there's, there's several births. And then if you go down here, you can see how tragic it was here in the space of what looks like in 1798, in four or five days, three of the snow sons died of dysentery. 
One was 16, one was four, and the other was two. And we'll do another one. And Gary, this one, this one's for you. This is the Coles family. Uh, we didn't have this when you came to Hatfield a couple of years ago. Uh, we just were able to do this in the last year or so. So I'll, I'll send this out to you, but from 1668, actually, there's a reference to Hannah. And we have lists of births, deaths, and marriages up to 1844 for the Coles family. Okay, moving on, a couple of the other interesting things that we can do is we wanted to know how many children were born in some span of years. Uh, we could probably do the whole 1670 to 1840 or so that we have the data for, but uh, the graphs become a little messy. So um, we just did 30 years ago. So for in the first 30 years of Hatfield, 1670 to 1700, takes a little time to run this here. We can, we can make a graph. And so we have here the number of children born, the date, and whether they're daughters in pink, sons in blue. Uh, a lot of the records, the, the uh, gender was not specified. So I just put child here and actually twins. So sometimes there were twins. So here's, here's a twin, for example, 1690, there were twins born. And just as an example, we'll do 1770 to 1800. Takes a little while to, to format this data. So, but it'll come up with a graph very similar to the, to the one we have here above it. So we can see again, number of children and the date, the year, and how many children were born of each gender. And here it seems there is more Late 1790s, there were twins born, looks like every year, 1794 to 1796. So again, you can do this for any number of years. These just were two examples uh, that seemed relatively simple to, uh, or we could fit on the page and you could actually read them. Okay, another thing we can do with this is we can look at the records and in a number of the records, um, the cause of death was listed not so much in the beginning part of the town, but maybe about 1770 or, or so, and later on, uh, causes of death were listed. So what I did was I put together a quick routine here that just allows us to look at the causes of death in the town records and to rank them. And it turns out that the most, the most causes of death were stillborn children followed by dysentery, dropsy, fever, old age was, was pretty prevalent. Number were slain, these are probably uh, from the earliest records. Consumption, typhus, and so on. Uh, and some, some of these diseases here are um, known today and there's some that, that aren't, aren't as known. Uh, and what I did was in order to make this a little more readable too, I dropped off the, the, the onesies and twosies here of, of uh, reasons for uh, causes of death. So it's, it's three minimum and then it goes up to actually, uh, looks like almost 47 or 48 uh, stillborn deaths. So seeing this, one of the things we can do quickly too is uh, we can see, okay, who were these children that were stillborn and do a quick list of, of those. And again, in, in doing this and putting the data in, in this format, um, you very, see some very interesting things. This Lieutenant David Billings here uh, had a stillborn child in 1776, two in 1778. and another in 1784. So I think his family had, had a really tough time with, um, with stillborn children. List. And this goes to 1792, actually. So actually in this one, 
I included the town records and some of the church records you can see down here. So they're probably duplicates here. You can see Lieutenant David Billings again. But um, so again, I don't think I completed all of the uh, all of the church records, but the town records should be complete, at least for all the ones that, that we had um, uh, photocopied by Peter Thomas. So let's see. So if we wanted to look at dysentery, we can find all the deaths and who died due to dysentery in Hatfield. And again, I'm not going to go through this, but um, here again are the snow children uh, that died in the same year in, in um, actually four or five days. And it looks like here's another group too, uh, the Blanchard family. Looks like they had four children die of dysentery in 1776. So again, you, it makes it very easy to pull that kind of information out of, out of all this data. Okay, if we go to the marriage records, one thing I noticed uh, when I was going through these was that there was a very high incidence of uh, certain names like Mary, Sarah, and Hannah in early Hatfield. So I said, well, okay, these, these are the marriages. So who, who are they? And you can very quickly find out who they are. There were actually in that 30 year span, 1670 to 1700, there were 22 marriages of women named Mary in Hatfield. If we look at Sarah, there were 13 in that same period. And if we look at Hannah, there were five. So here's a case where there probably weren't any more than 60 or 70 house, house lots and maybe families in Hatfield in that period. And almost a third of them were named, the, the women that got married were named Mary, and another third of them, either Sarah or Hannah which is just an interesting kind of fact, but something that you can pull out really quickly and easily uh, from this kind of data. Okay, so simple, just simple things too. We can find the number of marriages um, from 1670 to 1840, for example, and we can put in any, any range of dates we want, but these are the actual, just the numbers of, of marriages. So the number per year, and it shows how many were married. It looks like uh, late 1770s here around the revolutionary area was, was a, a good time to get married. A lot of people did get married. And it looks like 18, maybe 1835 was a good year also. There were quite a few marriages in Hatfield. Not so many in the early part of the town, just probably just because there weren't that many people. Uh, one of the questions I, I thought of asking was, um, was there any <clears throat> um, month that people like to get married in over any other? So one is, one is January and 12 is December here. So I just plotted the number of marriages. And it looks like most of the marriages were uh, in the winter months, the end of the year, November, January, uh, sorry, November, December, and, and January, and not so much in the summer, July and August and September in these months. And I also asked myself, well, was there any special day of the month that uh, people like to get married? You can make another plot and answer that question. And I think the reason I, I thought of this was it, it looked like there were a lot, of, a lot of marriages on the first of the month and around the middle of the month. And sure enough, when, when we looked at the data, uh, first of the month, there were a number and the middle of the month, there seemed to be a number of marriages. Also a number later in the month too, but uh, these seem to be the prevalent times. And finally, um, I asked, was there any specific day of the week that uh, people back then like to get married. And to do this one, I'm going to share a different screen here. This one. So what I did is I put together a number of graphs 
<clears throat> to make this little, um, it's not quite a movie, but um, click through these things. So, so this is the number of marriages and when they occurred on what day of the week. So this was from, and if you note up here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this number up. Uh, every time I, I put a new picture here, this will click up 10 years. So from 1670 to 1680, the number of marriages shows up and which days of the week that they occurred. So let's do another one to 1690, 1700. And it looks like, it looks like, People like to get married Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Drop down here, the middle of the week, not so much. If we keep going, 1710, it looks like Sunday, Saturday and Sunday look, look like they become preferable. 1720, so 1730, 1740. So these are the number of marriages that you're accumulating over that period of time. 1750. 1760. So just as now, we, we seem now to get married, have a lot of marriages Saturday, Sunday, and maybe not so much Monday, but maybe Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So from 1670 to, to 1760, it looks like it was pretty much the same, the same thing. There were marriages during the week, but the, the preferable days were Saturday and Sunday. If we go to 1770, the other days bump up a little bit, but then something happens in 1770. We go to 1780. So I'll give you a little bit of a hint. Uh, watch the numbers here. This is so in, up to 1770, there's about 100 marriages, maybe 110 on Sunday. And if you look at Thursday, there's probably 40 or so. So if we go up to 1780, you see a big jump in Thursday, 1790, 1800, 1810, 20, 30, and 40. So over that period of time from 1770 to 1840, everything seemed to change on the preferred day of marriages. The Thursday, for some reason, became a, the preferred day. And that probably had something to do with Joseph Lyman, the reverend coming to town in the early 1770s. Uh, he may have decided that Thursday was marriage day, but we don't know that for sure. There may be some other reason for that, for that happening. And that's something that, uh, you know, maybe someday someone will, will determine. So this is really all I had. Uh, what I wanted to just show is that once, once we have the data uh, transcribed and digitized and it's put into the format, especially these the spreadsheets, um, there are a lot of questions, pretty simple questions uh, that can be answered um, and data can be, can be dug out of the documents and, and used for writing blogs or researching or whatever it is you'd like to do with it. So, um, that's all I had. Um, I'll stop the share and we'll go back to if there are any questions on this portion. If not, uh, Meg is going to talk about available projects. Are there any questions at this time for George's portion? All right. I'm not seeing any. I will continue. Now we'll see if I'll be able to share my screen successfully. All right. Oh, no, I got it in the wrong order. Give me a second. Dun, dun. Share screen. All right, how's that look? Kathy or George or someone, can you? No. Um, nothing, it's not shared yet. No, for some oh, it's not sharing. Yeah. Uh, um, right. So, right, sometimes you'll, you find the thing, but then you actually have to hit the button share screen. Again, yeah. Hello? Hello? How are you? <laughs> okay. You're not well. Hold on a minute, I gotta 
turn something off here. I don't know what. Are you are you finding your something is your, something yeah something's gone on like I don't know what that was about. It seems like someone was here for a minute and then dropped out. Oh, uh, I think that was Deb Blodgett that was on maybe. And, oh, okay. Um, but anyway, so are you finding your file and yep. it's just not sharing or? Yeah, here you go. How's that? Uh, it says Meg Baker has started screen sharing and there we go. Great. Ta -da. All right, I'll just make it bigger. Come on. Sometimes waiting for the technology is the largest, longest part of the piece. Mm. All right. There we go. Okay. Okay. So uh, the documents that we have available ready for transcription, the first place we want to look is at the uh, documents available on our digital commonwealth and archive.org pages, sites, and you can go there and look at them anytime. They're wonderful. They're full of fun, great old things. Letters, deeds, account books, manuscripts from the 17th through 20th centuries. But please do let us know and we'll work together. And that's the last slide I'm going to do about signing up to do these because it would really muddy the waters if we all just were like jumping in to transcribe things. Um, this little bit here is a little pledge to pay to Rachel Billings uh, some money owed. And that is what's going on in that slide. So we do have those up um, and they're ready to go using the techniques that George has laid out. The other, come on, the other second section is um, the photographs that Peter Thomas took of the hand transcribed records of from town hall. Um, and some of these, the birth and death and marriage records and a few other things are up on the town clerk's website. If you go to the Hatfield town mm -hmm. website, um, you can see some of those again, get in touch with us and we'll coordinate who's transcribing what. Um, but there also are available with a little bit more figuring out some of the church records and proprietor records that you know, George has worked with in the past. Um, and again, great thanks to Peter Thomas for photographing these. Uh, George and I were speaking earlier that it would be lovely to know who did this transcription because these handwritten transcriptions on this uh, legal paper, you know, yellow legal pad paper, these are transcriptions of original documents that are at the town hall that were the original records. Um, so we'd love to know who did that. If anybody has any ideas, speak up. And then another great collection that we would love to have transcribed is the Porter McLeod correspondence. And this is a piece of it, one of the portions of the traveling sales letters, but we have uh, a lot of different documents um, between customers and suppliers. And uh, we have also some other pieces of the Porter McLeod papers that we could have uh, eventually transcribed down the road, which leads us to the next slide. Stage two, <laughs> after we get those done, the town hall, you know, the, the records that are up uh, are uh, available through town hall and the ones that are on digital commonwealth and archive.org and all of the earlier collections that are ready. We have a whole bunch more. So if this turns out to be something you like doing, um, there's, there's plenty for you to do with the uh, Hatfield Historical Society. Um, George mentioned the Ryan collection of Hatfield documents, the Port Porter McLeod documents that I mentioned. Then we also have a lot of scholarly articles. We have several different personal diaries. We have several different sets of letters um, coming right up. We have a collection of letters from Vietnam that are on display now. You know, there's so much to do because getting them into a digital format that we can extract the data from, from in the way that George has shown us over these three lessons uh, just opens up so many more stories. So we're really excited for y'all to be part of that. And that leads us to 
inviting you to join us. Uh, it, there's so much that we can learn from the data if we make it accessible. Transcribing it makes it accessible. It's also really, really fun. And I'm sure George and everyone else who's given it a shot at any time, you know, Deb Blodgett and Peter and et cetera, et cetera. It's fun to find out these clues, like just looking at those, that chart of marriage dates and um, days changing, you know, that's a clue. Something happened. We don't know what, but it'd be fun to find out. So there's a link there that um, we, that I'll put in the comments when this goes up uh, eventually on YouTube. And we can also send it out to anybody who's interested. Just let us know if you signed up for these sessions, uh, just send us a little email. We'll send you that link. Um, there's a lot of projects available. We're really eager to have you part of the digital volunteers transcription team. Um, so please check in with us to get started. And I'm just going to ask again if there's any questions or anything else that anyone would like. I'm going to stop. Actually, no, I have one more slide. Um, but I can, I can stop the screen share and just check to make sure. Any questions? No, okay. Kathy has a question. Um, I actually don't have a question, I have a comment. Um, so um, I also just wanted to, um, to just uh, like, for instance, the stage two projects that we had, those items are not yet scanned, but if someone you know is not so interested in some of the older, um, things that are listed on digital commonwealth um, or archive.org, although there's a lot of more recent stuff there too. Um, you know, like uh, the ledger book of the Hatfield Gas Company from the early 1900s, you know, something like that would be fabulous to get transcribed. Um, there's a, you know, a diary of uh, Dorothy Jandinsky, um, Hatfield Polish girl from, I think it's like 1931 or something where she just you know, kind of lists, you know, what the weather was and they were picking onions and, you know, graduating from high school next week and, and just all these little bits and things, but they paint a wonderful picture of what it was like to live in Hatfield during that time, especially as a high school student. And so, you know, there's a lot of fun stuff there. Um, and we, we didn't put up a link for our Digital Commonwealth and um, uh, archive.org okay. page because it's, you know, you can't, link to it, um, you know, from this, uh, from this program. But um, the thing is, it's just Hatfield Historical Museum. If you search on Hatfield Historical Museum and Digital Commonwealth, you'll go right there. Hatfield Historical Museum and archive.org, you'll go right there. And then you have the whole collections and you can, you know, search on different types of things. You can search by year. So I would really encourage any of you who are interested or potentially interested is to go take a look at those places first. Mm -hmm. But Point being, if you see something on that list on that slide that um, that Meg showed, which you know this will be up on our YouTube um, channel next week, uh, maybe sooner than that. Um, if there's something there that you are really interested in, then we could you know see if we can you know get some of that scanned for you to for you to be able to work on that. So, um, and we'll definitely make sure that there's links uh, when, once this is up on YouTube, we'll make sure that there are links below to the sign up page and to the digital Commonwealth and the archive.org um, because that way you can click through. Um, and I think that sums up tonight. If there's any yeah, other questions. The other thing I was going to say was um, I think better than waiting to see who's, who emails us to ask for that link, we'll just email it to all of you. So you have it and then you can decide, you know, what you want to do. I think that'll be easier. And if there are any, um, I think there were maybe some links and things, um, some resources, for instance, that Deb Blodgett had suggested in the first session, we can also yep. include in that email um, and any um, kind of resources or, or things that uh, George came across that he'd like to, um, you know, have be a resource for this class. We can include that also and just send out out to you know all of you and then you don't do anything with it fine but at least you know you'll have it so that's um, great um, and then we have a question from gary looks like oh yes great go uh, for it i'm not that a wizard on on excel spreadsheets and the turn the tables you were doing i think that's where it came from will you help us put together the starting point of a table of an excel spreadsheet and then as we populate it it will do the 
um, features you have shown? Yeah, we can we can do that. I mean, I think you know the kind of the rules uh, for doing that um, and the examples were in the second class. Uh, and sure, we can help do that. I'd like to get if I did something, I'd like to get set up right and not have to go back a second time and try to correct something. Yeah, what, what I found the simplest thing to do, though, is to do the transcription. Like if you're going through a journal, do the transcription, put that in there first, and then you get an idea of what's in there and you can figure out what the categories are that you want to have. So um, don't don't let the entire thing stop you from from starting. Okay. Uh, do it and then you can create those categories, those columns. And, and as I did, after I went through the whole thing, I put those in afterwards, almost after I got an understanding of what was there and what kind of things I would try to find. Um, I made the categories and uh, the items in the categories. So that can be filled in afterwards. I, I think um, doing that, you know, once you get started, you can do that. And, and yes, we can help create those and you know, ask the kind of things that you'd be able to, or you'd want to be able to find and, and come up with some good categories and the items to put in them. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. And also Gary, I'd say, um, as far as wanting to do it right the first time or not having to go back. Um, first of all, I think there's no like right answer about what gets included. Right. Um, and the other thing is, of course, you're going to have to go back. <laughs> um, you know, we're always having to add like, oh yeah, we, we, we need a column for this or like, this column should be over here, you know, and that's easy to do, you know, um, and we can help with that. Um, and, you know, if you're used to working with Excel, then that's that's a great way to do it. Um, if, if you're not, and you wanna just get started with Google Sheets, which is, you know, their Excel-like uh, version, um, it operates not exactly the same, but similarly. Um, and it has the same kind of features that are included on. The advantage of doing it on Sheets is that, you know, it can be shared, you know, between people if you share it, yeah. um, and Excel does not. We could make a template, you know, if that's something George mm -hmm. is willing to help uh, help with, um, we could make uh, a, yeah, starter, a, template. a starter template. And then people Google could Sheets. fill out their categories as they do transfer. As they need, Absolutely. right, as George suggests, yeah. yeah. All right, um, any other questions? All right, I don't uh, see- Bob, looks here. like has a question. Okay. Sorry, I've been, I, my sound might not be so great here. Um, do any of you happen to know if the John Hancock letter about digging the ditch has been transcribed or mm. if that's still untranscribed? I think that is untranscribed unless you have transcribed it. So I think no. if I you're willing to do that, because I, I know you have, you know, explored that and also found out where the ditch is and took a lot of pictures of that. And we were going to do a blog post about it. So uh, if you'd be willing to transcribe that, um, that would be a fabulous piece to put together as a multi-dimensional uh, post. I think, I think Bob just called dibs on that. <laughs> well, if anybody else wants it, I'll split it up. We'll do it page by page. Paragraph by paragraph, I'm fine yeah, with that. I think since you've already started on that, um, you'd, you'd yeah. be the best person to do it. I agree. All right. And for those of you who don't know, yes, we do have a letter in our collection that was signed, that's signed by John Hancock. He wrote about, um, you know, the very highfalutin um, subject of a blocked drainage ditch that people in Hatfield had written to him about. <laughs> Someone's got to take care of it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. So let's see. Um, so we're going to go to that last screen, yep. and then, and then you can. Right. After I give my pitch, then you can tell about the next week's program. Okay. All right. Can you can you see the screen? No, I cannot Not yet. Sure. All right. Let's see if I can get all these things together in one place. Is Monica trying to say something up there? I was saying hi to Susan. Oh, okay. <laughs> <coughs> All right. There is the last thing. Okay. If you can full screen it, that's great. Um, if not, oh, sure. it doesn't matter. Um, so just as before, for those of you who've been here uh, the weeks before, I just wanted to one, uh, 
thank uh, George, um, our fabulous presenter, for doing this uh, series of three programs. Um, you know, not only a huge amount of work to put the programs together, but the huge amount of work he's done for transcribing these documents and making all these, you know, spreadsheets and really kind of being able to tease a lot of information out of it. Um, maybe don't worry about it, Meg, because, uh, you know, just leave it as okay. it is. So, um, and I also, um, uh, again, want to thank our uh, funders. Um, this whole project wouldn't have been possible without the grant for Mass Humanities, which was funded by the Mass Cultural Council. And grants really do let us do things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise because we just don't have the resources. Um, so having the grant has been fabulous. Um, uh, and you know we have a lot of volunteers, including George, who have worked to put together programs for this, as well as our next three presenters that are coming up. Um, so anyway, just want to thank all of those people. Nice round of applause for, for George for a great program. And um, uh, you know, we would love to have you guys um, do some transcribing with us. So next, um, we have three more programs coming up um, in the series, and Meg is going to tell you about um, next week's program. All right. So next week's program, uh, Thursday, November 4th, is Thinking Outside the Tree. And the, the tree here is your genealogy, genealogy, Developing Your Genealogical Skills and Discovering New Sources, presented by Susan Donnelly. And in this presentation, you'll learn how to organize a structured workflow, where to find online and local repositories you might not already be familiar with, tips for getting through various brick walls. And Susan Donnelly is a professional genealogist, so she'll be able to help us um, with like a, more than just what we would do in our, in our um, little efforts. So uh, she's a professional genealogist with the publications department of the New England Historic Genealogical Society in Boston. So um, she's recently moved to uh, Hatfield. We're very lucky to have her and we are eager to see this lecture and we're hoping you'll be there too. Okay, any, any uh, final comments, thoughts, questions, anybody? Okay, everybody have a great night. And uh, thank you so much for joining us for these programs. See you next time. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ruth. <laughs>